Imagine a game. Now imagine 50 of them. Welcome to UFO 50. There's been some insanely impressive indie games over the past 20 years. Boundary pushing, technically masterful, generation defining works of art that stand toe to toe with some of the most beloved games ever made. Then there's UFO 50, which is just fucking absurd. 50 retro style games. Not mini games, not micro games, not demos, not a bundle of existing stuff that's been repackaged. 50 games. New ones. There's RPGs, beat em ups, races, puzzles, strategy, platformers, shooters, balloons, tower defense. Some of them are pretty short, but most of them are really, really long, or they're infinitely replayable. There's overarching lore that hangs over the whole thing, a trophy system that rewards you with furniture for this pig's house. I don't know why, there's a game in here that's really five games. They weren't satisfied with 50, they wanted 54. It should be terrible. It has every reason to be a self-indulgent mess that bit off way more than it could chew. The gamers were so preoccupied with whether they could that they never stopped to think whether they should. They tried this 33 years ago and it didn't work. It was so bad it became infamous for being terrible. Don't do it again! It's so massive and unwieldy and constantly at risk of collapsing under its own weight. And yet... It's good. It's really good. What the fuck? It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet where every meal is as fresh and inventive and stylish as the last. The music's great, the visual style's great, the game design, oh fucking lord this shit is good! I've put over 80 hours into it and I've still barely scratched the surface. This isn't a quantity over quality thing, this is quantity and quality. Oh, it's good. God, fuck, it's good. Not convinced? Okay, okay, let, let me just show you. Let me just show you what level this thing is operating on. Mortal is kind of like lemmings mixed with Mario. You gotta expend lives to get through the level by blowing stuff up or making a little staircase. It's so satisfying. Campanella is a game about flying a little spaceship around a bunch of mazes. It's got tons of hidden secrets. The music's really good. Feels great to control. Banger. Absolute banger. Night Manor. Ooh, a point and click horror game. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Pin golf. It's golf, but it's also pinball. I am terrible at it, but I love it. Golfaria. Also golf, but not pinball this time. And it's also a top-down Metroidvania. Hell yeah! Seaside Drive is the new Ojiro Famito game, so of course it's amazing. Rock on Island. It's literally just balloons. I love balloons. Pilot Quest is the original Zelda mixed with cookie clicker, and it shouldn't work, but miraculously it does. Avianos, it, it's civilization, but with birds and dinosaurs. Rail Heist, it's like an immersive sim heist game with turn-based elements. Again, shouldn't work, fucking does. <laughs> Hyper Contender is one of many really good multiplayer games in here. This one's a bit like Smash Bros, but with some really fun movement mechanics. Party House. It's a deck builder about raising popularity at your party so you can afford some aliens. It's really hard, but it's really addictive. That's just 12 games. I could keep going. There's a literal arena shooter in here, there's a horse betting game with aliens, there's a classic Final Fantasy style RPG set in a post-apocalyptic wasteland with cowboys. There's a game where you play as a walrus who can fly, and it's really good. What? What? I kept thinking while going through these games, well one of them's bound to be bad in a minute, and then none of them were. There's a couple that are almost bad, either because they're not explained very well, or because it controls like shit, or some other reason. But I wouldn't say any of them are flat out bad. Even the worst stuff in here is incredibly charming and likeable. Mooncat is like if Bennett Foddy made Mario, and it's as hellish as that sounds. So if you want to move left, that's quite self-explanatory, uh, you just hit left. Uh, if you want to move right, that's also quite self-explanatory, uh, you press A. And yet, I still kind of like it. I don't want to play it necessarily, but 
I respect it. It's this weird little experiment. It's an experiment that went horribly wrong, but you know. What the fuck? That's really the thing that makes this whole collection so interesting to me. Because every game is an experiment. What if we mixed Metroid with VVVVVV? How about a first-person horror game on a 2D game console? What about an underwater RPG? What would a super primitive immersive sim be like? What if we did a sequel to that other game we made? And what if instead of just making some more levels, it was an open world roguelike? Cause fuck it. And what if we did another one, but this time it's a racing game? And what if we did another one, but this time it's Star Fox? And what if we did another one, but this time it's Zelda? And cookie clicker. It's not just, here's the Mario clone. Here's the Metroid clone. Here's the Final Fantasy clone. Buy it now, at Woolworths. It's remixing old and modern ideas into something completely new. It's a tribute to the NES and SNES era, yeah, but it's also a tribute to Newgrounds and itch.io and indie games as a whole. You never just get what you think you're gonna get when you dust off a cartridge. It's always a little bit weird, and that makes digging through this collection so exciting. Campanella 2, for example, is the sequel to Campanella 1, obviously, but it plays absolutely nothing like Campanella 1. Instead of being an arcade game, it's a roguelike where you fly a little spaceship around collecting stars, but you can land and get out and go in caves to explore. It's got a really great risk versus reward system based on the spaceship's fuel. You could go for the easy stars right off the bat and finish the level quicker, or you could explore some more, leave those until the end and get a big payday. As long as you don't crash. The music's really good, it's got a great atmosphere, and crucially, it's really fucking funny. Highly recommend. Then you've got Seaside Drive. Oh, he's back. The king is back. Not content with releasing his last game on the nichest platform imaginable, Ojiro Fumito put his newest game on a game console that doesn't even exist. Lunatic. If you love how Downwell and Pointy feel to play, you'll love Seaside Drive. It's a shoot 'em up, but you've got to constantly charge up your gun by drifting to the left hand side of the screen. It sounds really simple, and it is, but it feels amazing to play. But neither of these hold a candle to Minion Max. Holy shit. I've talked before about how much of a sucker I am for being a little guy in games. Pikmin, Katamari Damacy, that one level in Astrobot. It's a concept that is so inherently fun, and not nearly enough games capitalize on it. Minion Max is a full-blown, 10-hour-long Metroidvania about shrinking down to the size of an ant and exploring a room. It's brilliant. And it's not just brilliant for that conceit alone, but how it builds on it, and builds on it, and builds on it. It's bursting with ideas in a game that is already bursting with ideas. There's mechanics in here that are just flat out genius. They're like something Nintendo would do. The world building is really cool. The art direction is fucking lovely. There are so many layers of secrets to stumble across. It's full of references to all the other UFO 50 games too. I would have happily paid 20 quid for just this. It's that good. Weirdly, one game that UFO 50 has a hell of a lot in common with is Immortality. Not because it turns into a horror game halfway through, sadly it does not, pack up your bags folks, but because of how they tell their respective stories. Immortality is a game about a bunch of movies, but it used that as a jumping off point to tell a story about the people who made those movies. UFO 50 is a game about a bunch of games, and it's using those games as a way to teach you about the people that designed them. It's a lot more subtle in UFO 50, it's not really the main focus, but it's there. You just gotta squint a bit. Between 1982 and 1989, UFOsoft made 50 games for their personal computer turned game console, the LX, one through three. Their first few games were a bit primitive, but as the years went by, they got more and more advanced. You can literally see the art direction evolve as you move through the games, but all the designs get way more ambitious too. 
They start off with some fairly simple arcade games, then they get a bit more fancy with it. Randomly generated space game, open world golf game, and from there it just cascades. Gorgeous sprite work, cutscenes, layers upon layers of extra gameplay systems, until you end up at Cyber Owls, which is simultaneously Metal Gear, Streets of Rage, Battletoads, and Wild Guns. And also a top-down tactics game. You can see the threads linking every game and the collection together, as one small part of another leads into another which informs another and so on. Campanella was really successful, so they quickly scrambled to put together a multiplayer spin-off in time for Christmas, and then rebranded the whole company, and then made two sequels that were wildly ambitious in two very different ways, and then put the pilot as a cameo in a bunch of other games. I ended up with this very vivid portrait of all the people who made these games, and yet, none of it's real, it's all fake. It does the immortality trick. All of this feels so authentic that I start to doubt myself. Maybe there was a game system called the LX3. Maybe there was a famous designer called Jerry Smolsky. Maybe there was a company called UFO Soft, and I just missed the Did You Know Gaming episode on that one. And that's without even mentioning the ARG. Oh yeah, they crammed an ARG in here too, because they hadn't done enough already. Whenever you pause the game, you can access a terminal screen that lets you type in some codes. What sort of codes? The secret kind. Here's one hidden in the opening cutscene. If you type it in, it boots up a turn-based version of a tactics, which is really cool. You can also type in exec-cs to boot up Seaside Drive, or exec-ufo2 to boot up Campanella 2, and so on. There's loads of cheat codes too. Uh, Ben's mode starts you off with 150 lives for Mortal. Wolf Dash Pack lets you have an entire team of dogs in Grimstone. Star Dash Ball adds the pilot and Waldorf to Pin Golf, which is fucking sick. And if you type in Greg Dash Milk, you get a symbol. That's ominous. I think I've seen that before though. Yeah, yeah, that's right, there's a room in Mini and Max with that symbol and nothing else. What happens if I open the terminal in there? Oh. If you follow this scavenger hunt to its conclusion, or just Google the answers like I did, you end up... Discovering the 51st game in UFO 50. They couldn't fucking stop themselves. It's a sort of walking sim where you play as Greg Milk, employee at UFO Soft, who recently just celebrated releasing their 50th game. Oh no. I started to get the impression as I wandered around this office that UFO Soft might not have been in the best place in 1989. There's an incredibly corporatized company culture, rampant abuse, a balance sheet that ain't looking too hot. A lot of the people that founded the company aren't there anymore, and the people that still are are clearly not doing okay. It's also really funny and a little bit sad seeing how terrible this company was at preserving its own history in a collection literally about preserving its history. The first prototype for Campanella, the most important game this company ever made, is just sitting in a cupboard in the hardware department. No one knew it was there! That would be like if the level designs for the first Mario were just in some fucking drawer. I know I said earlier that this game doesn't do the immortality thing and turn into a horror game halfway through, but you know, it sort of does. It's just not the boom kind, and more the working in the game industry is a waking nightmare kind. I'm not about to sit here and break down what this all means. I'm not Matt Pat. But it is super fucking interesting to me that clearly a ton of effort was put into the lore of this fictional game company that about 1% of the people playing this would even see. There's so many details and easter eggs that only start to make sense if you're effectively a die-hard fan of UFO Soft. You can talk to all the developers, but you only appreciate who they are if you beat all the games, watch the credits, and do some cross-referencing. For most people, that's a non-starter, me included, but it's still so cool that it's here. 
The joy in digging through this collection isn't just in seeing all of the mad ideas these guys came up with, but in seeing the rise and fall of a company through the art they left behind. These aren't just 50 disconnected games. There's a story here. It's yet another feather in UFO 50's ridiculously stacked cap. I think this game would still be an incredible achievement, even if it was a complete, unmitigated disaster. Because games are not easy to make, let alone 50 of them. Hundreds of people can spend eight years of their lives on a game, a tenth of their limited time on this planet, and the finished result is dog shit. Or it doesn't even come out at all. Or it does come out, and then two weeks later it's gone again. Like what? What the fuck? You can have the most talented team on the planet, enough money to move to Mars, almost a decade of dev time, and sometimes it just doesn't work. Look at Valve. Every project is a roll of the dice. Sometimes you'll get a 20, sometimes you'll get a 1, and sometimes the dice will roll off the table and under the sofa and oh shit, can't find it, someone get me a torch! Six people, over the course of eight years, rolled that dice 50 times. And not only did they all stay on the table, they landed on a 20. Every single time. Well, maybe not every time. They landed on a 10 at least. That's... That's not just borderline impossible. That is impossible. And they somehow pulled it off anyway. Because fuck it. UFO 50 is... A lot of things. It's fucking ridiculous, for one. It's insanely overkill, for another. But it's also... Brilliant. It's endlessly creative, surprising, and radiating with passion. It's a love letter to a medium that is never short of interesting ideas, and a heartfelt tribute to a company that doesn't even exist. It's the best value for money since the orange box, and... God, if it isn't the most inspiring thing I've ever seen.